Club takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Anita McCuit, and I'm the president of the Canadian Club Toronto. This year has seen a substantial increase in the amount of institutional investors that are incorporating environmental, social, and, go and corporate governance, or what we call ESG, factors into their portfolios. Investing in sustainable options is trending upwards, but greater transparency in the space to help investors understand which companies are actually doing what they say they are and which companies are just greenwashing, as we call it. Today, we're joined by financial and policy experts to help understand the challenges involved in sustainable investing. But before we dive into today's topic, here is some information to help you participate with us. The click here to switch stream button is your friend if you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio should stay strong. And we do want your questions today. So once you click the questions tab, you can just type your question in there and it will go straight to our moderator. Thank you to today's event sponsor, Navigator. And thanks to their generous sponsorship, today's event was free of charge. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we do depend on sponsors to keep coming together and putting out this great programming. So thanks again. Now to introduce today's speakers. Gerald Butts is Vice Chairman of Eurasia Group and served as Principal Secretary to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau from 2015 to 2019. Veronica Chow is a Partner and Director of Sustainable Investing and Social Impact at Boston Consulting Group. And Allison Lote is Managing Director of Sustainable Investing and Innovation at OP Trust and a past president of the Canadian Club Toronto. Today's expert panel will be moderated by Mark Wiseman, Chair of Al Alberta Investment Management Corporation. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in this virtual world is the toast that we make to our country at the start of every event. So if you have a drink nearby, please raise it, make a nod to the screen, and let's toast to Canada. To Canada. Canada. Mark, I will turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Thank you, Anita, and I'm delighted uh, delighted to be back uh, on the Canadian Club, uh, at least virtual stage uh, uh, today. Um, we've got a great panel. I want to jump uh, right into it. Um, we will make this um, as conversational as uh, as possible, um, and um, and hopefully we will get uh, time for lots of questions uh, from our audience members. But I, I want to get right into it, and, and, and Allison, I want to start um, with you. Um, we're talking about sustainable investing today, and we're going to get into some policy issues and uh, some structuring issues. But can you start and help us understand what is sustainable investing? That's what you do day in, day out. Can you define it for us? Uh, I will try. Uh, it would be embarrassing to be stumped by the simplest question. But um, I think you know, the reason you're probably asking me this question is that yeah, when it comes to sustainable investing today, I think a, a thousand or a million flowers are blooming. Um, ultimately, I think that's actually a very good thing, um, but uh, it does mean it's a little bit complex and confusing. 
Uh, when I'm feeling sort of particularly sort of inspired, I often think of sustainable investing as a way that sort of finance can can save itself. Um, and then on days where I'm feeling more cynical, I feel like it's sort of just an excuse for some kind of mediocre uh, marketing of people who are looking to uh, invest our money. Um, and, and probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as a sustainability, I guess, professional, and as, as all of us are on this call or on this meeting, uh, I, I just try hard to think about what does it mean for the objectives of the organization for which I work. Um, so as Anita said at the beginning, um, I have the honor of working for one of Canada's pension plans, um, stewarding the assets of uh, about 100,000 Ontarians and who work in the public sector and for Ontario's charities. So I really think about sustainability as how we can best align our investing to the, the long-term purpose for which we exist, which is preserving those pensions and making sure that people receive those pensions. You know, that said, uh, I also think it's important, and I also think of this as part of the definition, as how do we do that in a way that not only sort of minimizes the negative impacts that, that sometimes investing can have on people and on the natural environment, um, and more importantly, you know, do that, uh, invest that money and preserve those pensions in a way that um, addresses the many societal challenges that we have to face. So in short, I really think sustainable investing is a phenomenal place to be right now. Uh, it's full of, of innovation. It's still sorting itself out and um, looking really forward to exploring that with everyone today. Well, thanks. And, you know, I often think about sustainable investing at some level is about the convergence of, of, of values and value. And that at the end of the day, as investors, um, we care about, we do care about ultimately about, about creating value for our portfolios and ultimately our beneficiaries. Um, and what we're seeing more and more is this convergence in the long run of um, values and value. In other words, having good values creates um, greater greater value in the, in the long run. But Veronica, just to go to you for a second, I mean, you serve lots of clients who are struggling with how to implement, uh, how to implement this, uh, this kind of new world order. Uh, people talk about uh, screening, they talk about thematics, they talk about integration, they talk about impact. Can you help our audience who might not be familiar with that nomenclature a, a little bit to to sort of how how your clients and how investors around the world are starting to think about how they actually do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as, as Allison indicated, this is such a dynamic time in the field of sustainable investing. And there have been efforts now to start to codify and give names to the different ways in which investors are intentionally incorporating environmental, social and governance data into their investment decisions. Now, the early version of this flavor of investing tended to use a number of exclusions, right? So let's let's avoid tobacco stocks or let's screen out some of the worst performers. And that still remains one of the most popular forms of sustainable investing. But where we see a lot of really interesting activity of late are the much more nuanced and sophisticated approaches, one that was referred to as ESG integration, where stock analysts are in a very bottoms up, very deep way going into how are companies managing the ESG risks that they face today and how well positioned are they to realize opportunities in the future. And then you mentioned impact. And impact investing is again, a really uh, dynamic and exciting space. And what we see there are investors who are pursuing environmental or social goals alongside a financial return. And in some cases, even willing to give up a little bit of that financial return in pursuit of societal ambitions. So just on that point quickly, um, Allison and, and Jerry, I will get to you in a minute, but I'm, I'm gonna stick with the women for a second here. Um, um, uh, um, Allison, do you, do you, at OP Trust, do you think about that, that return trade-off? Are you willing to give up uh, return for a sustainable outcome? And, and, and what, do your, what do your beneficiaries say to that, if that is the case? Um, I, I think we have to challenge that uh, that framing that we often hear, which is that you know it's either you know do good things or lose money, you know, and lose money or make money and do bad things. Um, so I, I think we're seeing, frankly, uh, that's being turned on its head. So at OP Trust, I have a really interesting role because I'm responsible for you know all that ESG integration that Veronica just talked about across our whole portfolio, um, but I also oversee the development of a new portfolio. Uh, which is proactively looking to invest in climate solutions um, and in people who are looking to really uh, basically 
do well by do good in a really meaningful way. So I think, you know, as a whole, we've always at OP Trust looked at both the risk and the opportunity side of ESG. My personal view is that opportunity side is growing more and more. So I guess the short answer to the question, Mark, is is no, we don't we don't see that as uh, as you know, you, you don't lose money by having by doing well on these topics. In fact, the opposite. And, and and maybe last question for for you or, or Veronica. Um, then I want to pivot to policy a little bit and bring in Jerry. But um, is it really all about the E and ESG? I mean, it seems that um, climate is is obviously overriding um, a, a lot of the narrative here. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Paris. We uh, uh, we know about the goals that we're we're trying to reach. We know the commitments that we've made. Um, and we also know that, particularly in the Canadian context, uh, that you know energy transition is an important part of, of our national story. Is it is when you think about sustainability, are are we is the action really on climate, or is there more more than that in your view? I'm happy to start. Go ahead. I guess where I would start is understanding. Let's start with even climate. Climate is above all a human issue in many ways, and some of them most foremost challenges in tackling the energy transition is how to solve for the communities who are at risk of negative economic impacts. And so even in the so-called E issues, there's a, a very important S that is the, the social considerations. But moving beyond just the, the climate topic, I think this particular year, because of the COVID-19 crisis, it has just shone a spotlight on the profound ways in which there are some glaring social inequities and the investors who I speak with around the world um, have really started to pay attention to this and bring that into their investment decision making. So be it, you know, I work with a bank in the United Kingdom that is now focused on directing more of its assets into more marginalized communities. I've spoken with investors who are supporting businesses in, in Africa to understand not just how they can support the businesses financially, but also support the women who are running them to address some of the gender based norms. Um, and here in uh, in North America, it's just the um, importance of ensuring that workers and community members are healthy and safe is now top of mind for investors. Yeah, and I mean, maybe just to sort of pile on in, in violent agreement with Veronica, um, you know, these are all intersecting issues. Um, and the S, the social side, which has to do really with how uh, businesses interact with their communities and treat their people, as Veronica said, is more important than ever. Um, when we talk about the energy transition uh, and that, you know, frankly, the, the whole industrial transition that, that we'll all have to be a part of, I think, if we want to survive, um, human ingenuity is going to be central to that. So in addition to addressing the inequities um, uh, there's also a need to really think creatively about how we harness human talent and how businesses do that. Um, and then governance, I mean, you can't do any of this without governance. Uh, my life before this, I ran a, a democracy think tank because you know, I like complicated problems, obviously. Um, so, I mean, I personally think sort of governance, both at national levels and, and other sort of jurisdictional levels, as well as at corporate levels is, you know, probably really the secret sauce that will uh, will help get us there. So, I mean, it, all three of these have to be thought of both in concert and also individually as just critical uh, in the coming years. So, Jerry, I want to I want to move uh, to you for a second. Um, you know, there, there's an argument uh, that the market will look after this. And if you believe that values and value are converging, if you believe um, that, um, uh, you know, customers, uh, be it business customers or, or, or con individual consumers are going to demand uh, different types of products. If you believe um, that, you know, companies that do a good job on ESG are going to be more valuable in the future, that we, we don't need policy. Uh, the market will sort it out. Now, I suspect you don't agree with that, um, but maybe you can tell me what you think the role uh, to start with. What is the role of government um, in terms of sustainable investing? Well, it's a good question, Mark. I, I It may surprise you to hear me say that I do agree with that. I think that um, centrally commanded or controlled economies are going to have a much more difficult time uh, solving these problems over the long run. And there's nothing like, I think it was Allison who just mentioned how important innovation and ingenuity is going to play in solving these problems. 
the market is the best, most dynamic uh, force we've ever invented as human beings to create ingenuity and innovation, and we're not going to get there without it. I think that um, it's also important to recognize that we're talking about ESG as if it's a new thing. It's not really a new thing. It's as old as investing itself. That people, as, as long ago as the Quakers, uh, uh, we've been investing our uh, property and our assets to achieve so what are term social ends. I think at the end of the day, all of these categories are relatively um, artificial categories. And I think we're coming out of a phase of investing, call it the Friedman era of the last 50 years, where the objective of the corporation has been very, very narrowly defined and um, separated from broader social uh, policy and broader um, uh, human aims, so to speak. So the very specific thing we're going through now, and I also agree with Veronica on how it's important to think about the E, the S, and the G. And while they do intersect, they're fundamentally different problems. As you know, I've spent most of my professional life on climate. And the markets, from a climate perspective, are trying to identify and absorb a risk that has been external to most markets for most of uh, industrialized civilization. And that first, of course, involves quantifying what those risks look like. And I think the, um, I think Allison charitably put it as a buffet of um, uh, uh, categories and uh, classifications. That's going to sort itself out, I think, in the short term. I think we're going to see uh, a couple of gold standard classifications. Our, our fellow Canadian, Mark Carney, is working on this for the COP26 process, which I know you want to get to. But it all gets back to the fundamental question, which is um, how can you be certain that what you're investing in is doing what it is telling you it's doing in order to uh, uh, attain your investment in the first place? And we don't have a good way of quantifying and reporting on that, that everybody agrees to. It's going to take a bit of time to get there. So I'm, I'm going to come back to disclosure in a, in a second because uh, I, I think it's an it's disclosure and data is an incredibly big issue here. And, and for those that are close to uh, um, what's going on, it's probably the biggest issue sort of befuddling the uh, the investment community and and the corporate community today around these issues. Um, but before we before we go there, I mean, how do you get? And I'll, I'll maybe uh, open this up to to anyone. But how do you, you talked about the, the problem of externalities and, 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 you know, economists have, as you say, have debated this for a long time. And, and how, you know, it goes back to the tragedy of the commons and, and, and Hardin's, uh, Hardin's paper, actually, in the, I think in the 60s on this topic. Um, how do you find a way to and what is the role of regulation in trying to in trying to get uh, those externalities to be internalized in, into the pricing mechanism? Well, if I could just uh, touch on that briefly and then hand it to my colleagues here. I, I, the most important thing governments can do is set long-term policy direction, right? And most governments are doing that. Uh, this year alone, China, Japan, Korea, Canada, hopefully the United States with the change in administration have all set very broadly determined long-range goals to peak their emissions by a certain date and to achieve net zero, and we can talk about what that means, because uh, I'm not sure everybody listening would be familiar with all of these details. It's probably why they're listening in the first place. But to me, that's what government should do. This is the way we're going, set a broad regulatory framework to achieve those ends, and then let the market do its thing. Veronica or, or Allison, do you want to comment on, on that? I mean, sure, I can I can just come in with a couple of comments. I mean, I, I agree completely with Jerry. I think one of the, the challenges that has faced uh, institutional investors who've wanted to invest in, we'll say that the transition, could use it broadly, uh, it, renewables, clean tech, name your, name your version of it, um, have been challenged and sort of burned by the lack of clarity, stability, and predictability of government policy. So when governments change and policies change and all that has made people skittish, I think we're coming out of that, but there's definitely a lot of scars. Um, so the more that there are sort of consistent, predictable 
policies coming out of governments uh, globally as well as nationally, you know, the better off that is. Um, at the same time, I do also think it's important for people to recognize the other role that governments play. Um, not every uh, issue can be solved by the market. And in fact, that's why we have market failure and we have government to help with those areas. Um, one of the, the big themes when we're talking about the the transition, the, the industrial transition is going to be whether or not that is just. And we do know it, it, it may not be. Um, you know, we've all lived through COVID for nine months and we have seen the massive role that governments globally are playing in stabilizing people's lives. Um, and I think it is critical for investors uh, to also just recognize and, and just, just folks in general, not everything is a market solution. And we have to respect the roles that government play in addressing um, some of those issues that, that frankly, you know, we will never be able to, to address. Yeah. Before we go to disclosure, Veronica, I'm, I'm just going to prompt you for a second here. I mean, you're sitting in uh, Washington D.C. right now, um, you know, inside the uh, inside the Beltway in the swamp, um, so to speak. Um, I don't think it's been fully drained yet. Uh, <laughs> let, let me just just ask you: Does does Biden matter? And then, Jerry, I know you'll probably want to comment on that as well. Does, does Biden matter in all of this? Oh, absolutely. The change in administration is being tremendously well received by those who are um, pushing the broader sustainable finance market development on a few levels. Let's start with, with policy and the importance of providing that stable policy environment uh, and not just at a macro level, i.e. an overall net zero um, commitment, but even going into very sector specific roadmaps. The Biden platform laid out some very concrete ways in which uh, be it fossil fuel subsidies or other sorts of measures that would take that would enable that certainty for banks and investors to start to move assets. Moreover, coming to disclosures, the Biden administration is anticipated to uh, work through the SEC and other regulators to advance the, both the quality and the coverage of disclosure standards, which again will be quite catalytic to this market development. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. Political leadership always matters on these big picture questions. Uh, Joe Biden campaigned on easily the most aggressive climate plan in the history of the United States. It would have been inconceivable to have either party campaigning on it as recently as the last uh, election cycle. So it's really going to matter. A divided government, depending on the outcome of the two runoff Senate elections in Georgia, will also uh, hamper, uh, that'll hamper his, certainly his um, legislative ambitions. And uh, we talked to the team all the time and I asked one of the senior people right after the election what they felt they lost by not by the blue wave not happening. And he said, oh, about two trillion dollars. So I think that these are those are material outcomes. But as you know, uh, as you folks know, and Veronica just alluded to one really important field of activity through executive action and the regulatory power of the White House. He, the president of the United States is always relevant and he or she can change the rules of the game. So I do want to move to um, uh, um, disclosure. And, and we've, seen, we've seen how presidential act, uh, action has affected the last four years. And so um, if you didn't believe in that before, you certainly believe in that now. Um, I do want to move to the, to, to the disclosure point. And I, and I, I want for our viewers just to, to just frame this a little bit on how important it is because you know, imagine you're in a world and you now believe, as I happen to believe, that these factors are critical to the valuation of your investments. Things like um, GHG emissions, things like um, um, supply chain, um, things like uh, employee uh, relations, um, et cetera. And if you believe that those are becoming more and more important to the value of your investments, the one thing you need is information and data in order to make that decision. So. To me, um, as it relates to factors like ESG, which are more and more important, particularly in generating alpha, um, it's it's almost like a world where um, you have accounting statements, but no standardization of accounting statements. So, so imagine if you had unaudited accounts in public companies, um, there was no such thing as GAAP, there was no such thing as, as IFRS, and you sort of got this mishmash. And that's a little bit the world that we're in today with these factors that are non-financial yet um, arguably um, more important in terms of generating alpha in portfolios than uh, financial information, which is kind of quickly priced in. So, Veronica, I want to start with you because you're you're an expert in this. Uh, you and I have done a fair amount of work on this issue in the last few months. Give us a lay of the land a little bit in terms of uh, disclosure, standardization, 
Um, there's sort of an alphabet soup out there for those, you know, there's there's SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, there's um, yeah, there's there's GRI, there's CPD, there's probably 20 other acronyms. Uh, IIRC, where where are we in all of this? And 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 then Alison, I'm gonna come to you and ask you what to maybe explain how you manage it as an investor. Great. Yeah, so as you exactly as you alluded to, Mark, there are two fundamental challenges that we are working on. One is what what should be measured, what should companies disclose? And that's the whole world of different frameworks. And the challenge there is how can we potentially bring some of those frameworks together and start to provide data in a much more consistent format. The second question is how? How do we get to a world in which there is sufficient enough coverage across enough companies so that banks and investors can more systematically incorporate that data en masse throughout their portfolios? Um, so let's start with the what. What should be what should companies be disclosing? Um, what metrics should they be using? Now I think what's what's uh, really interesting is between Europe and North America, we've seen two different approaches. Uh, in North America, we've seen the uh, a number of voluntary organizations like the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. Um, developing standards and think of them almost as like a, a product development shop, if you will, for the sector, working closely with industry, with investors, really trying to get to what, what sorts of indicators might make sense. Similarly, GRI uh, does that not just for investors, but they come up with uh, indicators that assess the materiality of factors that measure to, that matter to, to society as a whole. Um, what is really encouraging is as of recently as September of this year, a number of these large framework organizations, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, SASB, the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, the Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, along with the Integrated uh, uh, Reporting Initiative and um, uh, I'm missing one. CDSB. one, CDSB, the Carbon Disclosure Standards Board. So the five of them got together and said, we are going to figure this out. We are going to figure out a way to bring together frameworks that measure on one hand what's material to investors, what's material to society, and put that together into some kind of cohesive framework. And we're, we applaud the leadership by those organizations and are really excited to see what's ahead. Since that announcement, we've also then seen mergers happen. So SASB and IRC are now merging. And then the final really inter, um, really important announcement is the IFRS itself uh, is now um, exploring options to launch a sustainability standards board for the accounting profession. And so I realize I've used a lot of acronyms and said a lot of things, but the top message is that there's we're seeing tremendous leadership by the different standard setters out there to, to really pull together uh, and develop a framework that uh, can provide that kind of consistency to companies. Well, and I think for those uh, for those of uh, sort of watching this that maybe aren't familiar with all of it, I mean, the thing that's important to understand is this is really important for companies and investors because um, it's as again, I, I think about it. Imagine a world where there was no accounting standards, and so it's it's really really important. And there's a very very big divide taking place um, between the Europeans and and the Americans. The Americans are much more on a principles based approach. If it's material, disclose it. Whereas the Europeans, um, you don't know, want very very uh, defined uh, standards, and and this may cause cause a problem. But Allison, from an investor's standpoint today, as you look at your portfolio, um, um, what, what, how are you managing this sort of alphabet soup and waiting waiting for these standards to come out um, when, you, when you look at the portfolio that you help to manage? Uh, first of all, Veronica, thank you for that answer because you saved me having to <laughs> talk about all those acronyms. Um, so uh, thank you, you've done us all a service. Um, so uh, I started my job about a year ago. And I think probably, you know, everyone who's been in a new job, you know, your job number one in a new job is figuring out, you know, of all the problems on your plate, you know, how do you allocate your time and which ones do you prioritize? Um, so having spent some time in this alphabet soup in a, in a prior life, um, you know, I'm very well aware that they're, you know, essentially, it will get sorted out. Um, and frankly, 
frankly, even the first sorting is going to be just the first sorting. I think it took something like 70 years for the gap standards. I know Anita as an accountant can probably correct me, but you know, it took a long time to get accounting standards and they still are being updated and argued about and things like there's different standards. So we're not gonna get there quickly. So then I think to myself, okay, we at OP Trust have a portfolio of which about 45% is outside of public, public markets. So we really own those assets. And in those private mark, in alternatives, there's actually very little data. Um, you know, if these standards, I don't want to say they're irrelevant, but they, they don't apply. It's, it's huge in a public equities portfolio, of course. Um, and, and a lot of our public equities portfolio is managed by third party managers. So, you know, our first job is to really work as an investing team to say, okay, how do we start to think about this more systematically? What are the things that matter the most to us? How do we start to work with our investors on them, uh, track our own data, figure out our own kind of answers? Because the the market isn't, pro it's not, you know, it's just not providing that. And like, frankly, I'm not going to solve it. <laughs> but I know there's a lot of really smart people that will. Um, and I think this is something for, you know, all people sort of leading teams to think about in this space. There's, it, it is such a dynamic and changing area. And the one thing we all have to get better at is just being smart about these subjects, um, understanding what we can influence and how do we, you know, be good practitioners of sort of responsible investing or stewardship of whatever our teams are working on. So we've uh, bluntly, Mark, fo focused a little less on the alphabet soup and a little more on, okay, what are the values that really underpin our theory of investing? How do we work with the the companies in which we invest or the or the partners with which we invest to make sure that they understand those and that we understand how they're doing it um, and that we can have conversations about that and improve it. I really think this is it sounds a bit processy, but I really do think we you know, all of us have to sharpen our uh, pencils on this. Um, and so we've really taken the decision to focus a little bit more sort of internally, I guess, than than worry necessarily about about sort of navigating the the uh, the acronym uh, world out there, at least for now. Okay, well, look, what I want to do now, I think those are, um, you know, it, it sort of belies how, how complicated all of this is um, and how investors are struggling. Uh, and, and companies. Mark, are... yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I think one other thing I'm sensitive to, I mean, right before this, I was on a panel and, you know, every investor is asking every company a slightly different set of questions. And, you know, the cost and the frustration, I mean, I used to run a charity, we get the same thing with all people that want to, you know, they want to give you a little grant, and then they ask you for reams of paperwork. Um, so we also have to be really thoughtful as, as, as players in this space on kind of the costs we're imposing. And, um, you know, I, I remember one of the, the CEOs I worked with in my prior job said, you know, the number of, of time, amount of time and money they spent on their sustainability reports. And he said, all my analyst calls in 10 years, I didn't get a single question. Now that's changing now, um, but it just goes to show, you know, being sort of thoughtful about what really matters probably at this stage is the most important first step for investors to take. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. There's, there's a, I've got a ton of audience questions, so I want to try and leave some time for it. But Sorry. before we do that, um, I, I want to bring it back closer to home. Uh, and Jerry, I want to come to you a little bit because um, it's obviously something you've uh, thought uh, tremendously about both inside government and outside of government, which is, um, you know, Canada in particular, the Western Canadian Basin, um, we are um, impacted by this trend uh, economically um, more than, than many countries uh, around the world. And as you see this shift um, in the way that investors are thinking about the world, you see how capital is being reallocated. Um, how do we think about it as a Canadian, as a particular specifically the Canadian energy industry? Uh, uh, goes beyond that because we are a country that's still um, less and less, but we're still, um, um, you know, we're still about uh, what is it? He hewers of what do you do? You hewers, drawers of water, and hewers of wood. Um, 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 so that we still have a big natural resource sector, but we also have you know, quite a large carbon footprint, both because of our climate, um, because of our geography and because of the industries that, that support uh, a, a good portion of the Canadian economy. So, but all that to be said, how is this going to affect Canadian industry? And, and how do we prepare for this, what I believe is going to be an increasing shift of capital allocation? It's a great question. It's probably literally a trillion dollar question, Mark. I, I, I think um, 
first of all, I just want to second something something Allison said earlier. I, I grew up in a coal mining town through the Atlantic ground fishery collapse, right? So I know what it's like to uh, see what happens to communities when these large economic shifts happen for either natural reasons or uh, capital flow reasons. So having an active role for, gov for government and cushioning the, the negative downside impacts for people whose livelihoods are being disrupted is one of the most important things that government does. Um, to get to your question uh, directly, I think there is good news in all of this. Um, it, there's, there is good news in all of this. If you believe the basic thesis, and I'm sort of in the analysis and advisory business now, as you know, we advise large pools of capital uh, on a bunch of things, but one of them is the energy transition uh, what is happening? Is it real? How long is it going to take? Where is it going to speed up? Who's going to get hurt, et cetera, et cetera. And within our global view at Eurasia, our perspective on um, hydrocarbons is that there will be a significant place for hydrocarbons in the global economy well uh, into this century, probably past 2050. They'll be offset by other activities in other parts of the economy. But uh, the, the, the hydrocarbon stacks that will form that um, sector are going to have a few really important things in common. One is they'll be relatively low cost, they'll be relatively low carbon, and they'll be relatively low political risk. There will be stability. We're past the point 10 years ago we were talking about stranded assets in this conversation. We're now talking about stranded countries. Canada is not Venezuela, it's not Nigeria, it's not Kazakhstan. So we've got in our view, two really important problems that we should be working collaboratively to solve. And that is the cost of the resource and the carbon content of the resource. We've got market access, diversified market access now. We've got political stability, uh, certainly in global comparative terms uh, in Canada and in Alberta. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, as someone who's been through this vexatious debate in Canada for most of my career, uh, the thing that I've learned, and it's partly why we structured the National Climate Plan the way we structured it, is that these um, transitions, the solutions to uh, the negative impacts of people on these transitions and um, uh, the growth capacity of provincial economies, those ideas have to come from within the province. There's a role for the federal government, in my view, in supporting those transitions and financing those plans and opening new markets uh, in uh, helping fund new forms of economic activity. But at the end of the day, and this is a tough thing, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's not going to work if it's imposed from without, uh, from outside the jurisdiction. Uh, people who live in Alberta and Saskatchewan should have a lot of faith in the future. There aren't many jurisdictions uh, in the world that wouldn't trade places with it. It's a very difficult time uh, right now. It was before COVID. It is through COVID, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a bit of a struggle afterward. But there is a future for the core industry, and the issue is how do you build out around that? Um, I, I want want to. I'm going to sort of bridge our. By the way, we've probably got about sixty or seventy questions from the audience, so we, we won't. We'll try and get to some of them in just a minute. I, I've got, I, I've got um, two questions um, uh, before we do that. The, the first is, um, you know, and, and maybe I'll start. This is probably to Veronica and, and Allison. Um, you can decide who wants to take it. Um, but this transition that that Jerry's referring to, um, it it requires. It's going to require us rightly stated, literally trillions of dollars in capital. For, for me as a, as a, um, for me as an investor, um, I actually see it probably financing that transition may very well be um, one of the greatest investment opportunities um, of a generation. Um, how do, how do investors, how ought investors to think about financing that transition economy and, and Maybe, maybe Veronica, you may have a view on that, given some of the work that I know you're doing with BCG clients. Yeah, at, at BCG, we're working with a number of investors and banks around the world who are, have come to the conclusion that stepping away from sectors, stepping away from clients is, is not going to get us there. And what actually is needed is that hand-in-hand -hand partnership between finance and industry 
to look hard at some of these very challenging issues and figure out solutions on a way forward. And as you're saying, Mark, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, BCG just released a report that we wrote with uh, 13 other banks uh, under the Global Financial Markets Association, uh, where together we estimated that the opportunity for banks to finance this transition will be somewhere between three and five trillion dollars a year globally once we're in that full full market maturity and you know in a business model where you you make money off of the volume of funds flowing through you that's an absolutely tremendous opportunity what it will take though is partnership partnership with government funders and and foundations and others who are willing to participate in some of the risk uh, partnership with civil society and partnerships with uh, innovators who are bringing new technologies forward. So I'm going to ask the last question before we go to, uh, be, before we go to uh, uh, audience questions. Uh, I'm going to ask this of, of, of you, Alice, and I, I might have an opinion about this one. So uh, I, um, want me to ask you, if I, if I don't, if I don't <laughs> like your answer, I'm going to answer it. Um, but what is the role? What is the role of, uh, obviously you work for OP trust. Uh, what is the role of pension plans, uh, particularly Canadian pension plans? In, in helping um, in this uh, in this transition uh, economy that uh, Jerry laid out and, and, and Veronica sort of um, enhanced. Sure. Well, I'll uh, I'll start and then why don't you finish? Um, <laughs> so Very uh, conversation. There we go. Um, so uh, I mean, a few things. I think first of all, you know, there's kind of COVID getting through COVID, and then there's you know the wider transition. Um, so you know, we've got to get through COVID in a good place. So pension plans are in all investors, you know, in how we uh, act are going to help, I hope, have, uh, you know, smooth the impact of COVID. I mean, to give you concrete examples, uh, at OP Trust, we have a very decent sized uh, real estate portfolio. We're working with our tenants. Uh, we're ensuring no one's getting evicted. Uh, we're helping people access government programs. I mean, it sounds sort of pat, but it's actually really important to make sure that, you know, we uh, we conduct ourselves with our businesses in a way that ensures their preservation and, um, you know, those jobs are secured. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a big one. Obviously, ensuring that we can continue to pay people pensions, all those things are core to what we do and what we uh, need to continue to do. Um, when it comes to the transition, I mean, I'm sitting here by biased because I'm responsible for actively finding opportunities to invest in that. So I obviously think there's a massive opportunity there. Um, but institutional investors are structured in particular ways. You know, another business I've been involved with a lot, it's the media business. And I sometimes feel like, you know, it's like you're like the digital guy at the Globe and Mail, you know, 20 years ago saying like, hey, the internet, um, you know, so there's definitely something quite similar that's happening. And you look at how institutional investors are structured. Uh, and very often where some of that most unique opportunities are happening actually fall between asset classes. You know, it's too risky for, you know, your infrastructure team. Um, you know, but it's not risky enough for your venture capital team or, you know, wherever it fits. But we all have, you know, divisions that are structured that have certain guidelines. And when economies are changing and transitions are happening too often, that falls between the cracks. So, you know, I mean, I'm biased. I feel very lucky because, you know, our team is actually charged with finding these, we don't have benchmarks. Um, you know, we don't have asset class restrictions. You know, we have an opportunity to really think creatively about how can we proactively participate um, and constructive, constructively in this transition. So I'll start there and then I'll let you tell, you can tell us the answer, Mark. <laughs> well, I think, I, think that is, I think that is the answer, Allison. but um, oh, you know, I think in simple <laughs> terms, I think it's important for, it, it is obviously my view, um, uh, uh, which is that I think it's important to remember that 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 pension pension fund uh, capital um, is there to maximize the risk adjusted um, uh, long term returns for literally millions of millions of beneficiaries. You have to uh, uh, both uh, be defensive, thinking about how uh, sustainability and ESG factors are going to affect your portfolio and offensive in terms of taking advantage of the climate transition opportunity to invest in and make a long-term uh, risk-adjusted return. Um, but it's not the role, and again, my personal view, um, of, of pension plans to uh, be um, an arm of policy, an arm of public policy. Right. And um, and so, you know, our, our as, as, as chairman of the board of a pension plan, you know, my view is that our job is to serve our clients and beneficiaries and that means maximizing their long-term risk-adjusted returns. It's uh, government's job or regulator's job um, to dictate 
um, the public policy response to things like climate change. Now, that public policy response may have an impact on the way that we invest, but um, we're not there to sort of subsidize um, that transition. We're there to make that risk adjusted return um, because frankly, it's not our money. It's not the government's money in the mo most part. It's, it, it belongs to, to the beneficiaries. My view, some people disagree, um, but that's a great thing about being a moderator. Um, I don't have to uh, have anybody take me on. So with well, that- it's, a, uh, it's an important point to make. And I think for, you know, everybody on the line, you know, our, you know whatever our job is, you know, we can't do everything. <laughs> and so it's really important to, uh, I think it's an important point you make, uh, Mark. Um, so with that, let's, uh, with, with that, um, uh, I'll get off my soapbox for a second and, and go back to the role of, of asking questions. So I'm going to start to work through some of our, uh, some of our audience questions. I, I want to start, um, maybe with Jerry, with, with you on, on, on this one. And, and there's been a couple questions from the audience, um, that have talking about ESG and China and, 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 and region. Um, I think one estimate that I've read is, um, you know, 70% of the world's greenhouse gases are uh, emitted in Asia. And of those 70% of that 70% um, is emitted by by China. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how we need to think about that? Um, how do we get Asia and China on board? Because at the end of the day, whatever we do um, isn't going to matter much um, if uh, change isn't seen in, in that part of the world. Sure, um, I'd quibble a little bit with the analysis. I think that the one of the most fundamental, and this is a physical and chemical property of emissions, one of, one of the most fundamental properties of them is that they persist, right? So we're not just talking about a flow issue, we're talking about a stock issue. And the West is overwhelmingly responsible for the uh, lion's share of the emissions that are currently in the atmosphere and that have caused climate change. And I'm sure if you speak to any uh, investor or policy expert from Delhi or Beijing, that is the first thing they will tell you that this is not a, a problem created by us. So I, I find that that argument is usually made with the, it's more advoc advocacy data than analytics, if I can put it that way. Uh, so I think it's important to kind of take a step back from it. It is absolutely true that um, if we don't create a global system that ratchets emissions down everywhere, we're not going to solve this problem. And it's in particular true of Asia. But it's also true if, if you uh, believe the most optimistic estimates about Africa. If the middle class doubles in Africa over the next 35 years, as some think it will, uh, we better have a plan for electrifying Africa that is not building thermal coal plants all over um, the continent. So from my perspective, I think the, 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 the issue is how do, we, how do we build out the system that we created in Kyoto and Copenhagen and Paris, make sure everybody is included in that system and have the appropriate accountability mechanism to make sure that emissions are ratcheting down everywhere. One more point, and this is a really important point, and it's directly related to China. China, uh, the Chinese leadership sees the energy transition as a strategic opportunity. And it's really important for people in the West to absorb that. It has not escaped uh, the Chinese government that countries that tend to be at the central nodes of the dominant uh, energy system in the world have enormous geopolitical power. This is core to what we talk to our clients about. And I would argue that the Chinese have seen that for a very long time. The energy transition, which we never defined, is really the transition from energy that's based on a carbon molecule to one that's based on a renewable electron. And China is currently leading the world in solar, wind, uh, and uh, the electric vehicle supply chain. We've got some catching up to do in those industries if we want to take advantage of the opportunities that we've been talking about here. And that's not a normative judgment. That's just an analytical fact. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're right, Jerry. And I think that w what I'm seeing today, at least, is the investment opportunities are actually expanding in Asia um, because there's an opportunity to, there's, there's just more, there's more to transition. There's, though there's, there's, there's more opportunity to invest in in the transition. Um, and all the marginal growth in the energy system is there, right? Um, okay, I wanna try and get to uh, 
we could go back and forth on this uh, even more, I'm sure. But I want to get to a few few more uh, a few more questions. I think this one's a sort of an interesting question. Um, uh, this is uh, somebody's asked about career opportunities in sustainable investing. Um, uh, you know, obviously, it's a, it's it is a it is a growth sector. Um, it used to be if you wanted to be an investor that uh, you know you had to uh, you know have your CFA and and know how to uh, manipulate a spreadsheet. Uh, maybe that's changing. Uh, what what are you seeing, Allison, in in that regard? Is sort of a newly minted, uh, reasonably newly minted uh, sustainable investor. Yeah, I had a feeling that was coming to me. Um, yeah, this is my first actually investing job, so I have to say I uh, I. You know, you sort of think in mid-career, it's hard to make a transition, but it's uh, it's a lot of fun. So maybe I'm like a little version of the what the energy industry will go through. Anyway, um, uh, so I just I when I was hired at OP Trust, part of my mandate was to build build a new team. Um, so I had you know firsthand the chance to see. Uh, if I can just be blunt, the quality of talent that is interested in getting into sustainable investing. Um, you know, I had people applying for jobs that were willing to move laterally or frankly take demotions um, to get into work that has purpose. Um, and they felt they could apply, you know, their more say traditional spreadsheeting type skills um, to something that had more meaning. Um, when we're out talking to funds, this theme comes up repeatedly. Um, you know, part of the reason we're taking a bet here is because I'm seeing the caliber of people coming out of Name Your Fancy school that want to get into this work. So um, so this is all really good news. And frankly, it's good news for a country like Canada, which has strong education, you know, Jerry, to pick up on sort of the energy transition conversation. I mean, I would bet some of the top energy talent in the world is sitting in Alberta. Absolutely. Um, and, and probably very excited to be sort of harnessed uh, uh, appropriately. So anyway, long story short, you know, I think for people on the line that might be interested in this work, um, you know, I can only speak to what we were looking to hire. I mean, there's obviously a base level of, you know, sort of investing sort of acumen and knowledge that you have to have. But we were very explicitly looking for people that uh, were bringing something a little bit different uh, because ultimately this is the culture change uh, that is going on within organizations, within industries. Um, and and you need people who can help lead that culture change. So it's less about sort of the pointy nose spreadsheet and it's more about can you work with others? Um, can you think through complexity? Uh, you know, can, can you sort of build coalitions and teams? Uh, can you think in a long term way? Um, so it's it's calling for a very broad skill set, I would argue a broader skill set than you might see in a traditional finance pro a professional. So for anybody who's out there on the line that's interested in them, interested in this, you know, 100%, you know, get your kind of nuts and bolts on the finance side um but you know be broader you know try to do things that that broaden your exposure and your thinking um and uh and i as i said i think it's a, a really exciting and it will be a hugely growing industry not only in investment but also in businesses as well uh, and governments and, and send your resume to allison you can find yeah. her on the, <laughs> on, the uh, on the talent side is as you look across banks and private equity firms what I find remarkable is that the majority of clients who I serve on sustainable investing, the, the head of sustainable investing, as illustrated on our panel, is a woman. And it's one of the few areas of finance that is dominated by female leadership and often uh, women of color. So, you know, again, for those out there who are looking for a place in finance and um, not necessarily seeing it in, in other parts of uh, your respective banks or uh, investment shops, uh, this is a particular place where diversity really thrives. I, I think that's uh, that's so true and a, and a great uh, and a great comment, um, Jerry. I want to come to you with another question. I, we're almost out of time. I want to try and get a couple more in here. Um, you know, there is um, still some resistance in in Western Canada um, to the idea of sustainability. Um, how do we how do we get people on board to this? How how do we? Um, you know, Allison talked a little bit about how important it is to sort of take a holistic approach, but how do we? educate and, and get Canadians on board with, with where I believe the world is moving. And I think we all believe the world is moving, but we have to bring people along. How do we do that? Yeah, I, I'd go back to what I said earlier, Mark. Um, it's going to take leadership from inside those communities and inside those provinces to get people on board with this, that uh, it's, uh, this is a, one of the foundational characteristics of Canada as a country is federalism. And if you don't think complex public policy problems through the lens of federalism, you're not going to solve them. 
and, and in particular, I come from uh, a region as well in Nova Scotia, uh, where there were no less resistant to solutions imposed from without, uh, from outside the province. And uh, I think that's the key. I, I think communicating with empathy and um, generosity of spirit is always goes farther than people think it does. Uh, and to try and detoxify the conversation whenever possible, whenever you have a conversation with somebody directly face-to-face -face or in Zoomlandia, where we're all living now, um, uh, make sure that people know there's nobody else in Canada out to get them. That uh, the people I know in, in the rest of the country, many, many people, uh, what ha the, the, what's in the, the positive best interest of people in Alberta is at the forefront of their mind. Um, so I want to end this um, with a question to each of you, um, and you can answer the question any way you want, um, uh, which is, um, I want to end it on, a, on, a, on an optimistic note. So who's doing this really well? And, and what, what, what do you see um, as, as the really positive aspects of um, developments um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this space? So. Um, I'll put Veronica on the spot to go first while the others think of their answer. But um, who, who is who is doing it well? And you can define that any way you want. And, and what gives you optimism uh, about uh, the future? Yeah, so we, we work across all the banks and asset managers. So I, I wouldn't want to call any specific client out. So maybe what I will say is here's who I see doing, making substantial contributions is civil society, right? So we work a lot with the science-based target initiative. We work with the World Economic Forum. We work with a number of these different entities that are using their convening power and or um, their, their their technical knowledge to bring forth the standards, to bring to create the forms that are bringing all of these different stakeholders together and, and really driving the development of this market. So I think what gives me hope is um, just to see not just investors and banks and companies and policymakers, but, but that broader civil society is coming along with us on this journey and recognizing just the, the importance of finance, but also uh, some of the ways that they can also contribute. Um, Allison? Um, I was hoping I wasn't gonna be next. Um, <laughs> so to be truly optimistic, I think people who are uh, doing a great job here are, um, you know, are the Canadian pension plans. Uh, they're not perfect, obviously, um, but you know, one of, uh, I started this job basically in January of last year. And the first thing I got to do was go to Montreal and meet with sort of the other sort of 10 big sustainability leads for the top 10 plans. And, you know, does everybody do everything perfectly? No. Are the challenges huge? Yes. Um, but the dedication and commitment that, uh, they have to sort of working through is actually is really inspiring and, and I don't think well appreciated by Canadians. Um, so, you know, I, I think the Canadian plans are really, you know, thinking hard and working hard on this and, and hence why I sort of feel proud to work for one. Um, so I'll maybe just sort of say that and, uh, and just sort of, again, just thank all of my colleagues uh, in those in in this because it is an area frankly Veronica to pick up on what you said where you know we are not working in vacuums we're working as groups we're working with our members uh, we're working with civil society uh, we're working with data providers uh, all of those things and kind of how we all bring that together uh, you know I think Canadians are are um, you know trying to be at the forefront globally of this. Jerry we'll give you the second last word. I assume I'm not allowed to say Canada, so I will say uh, Beat I to it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the Northern Europeans are doing a really good job. They punched out. The, there's a lot of inspiration for us to be found in countries like um, uh, Norway and Sweden and Denmark in particular. They've punched way above their weight. Uh, they have a very disciplined long-term program, and it's creating growth in their economies, which is really important. The new entrants, I think, Korea has South Korea has one of the most interesting decarbonization plans in the world and there are new uh, countries joining the club every day so hopefully there's a symbiotic relationship between all these plans and a race to the top at the end of the day. I'm also an optimist. I think this problem gets solved. Uh, I think it gets solved largely for demographic and generational reasons. The largest generation in the history of the world it was born between 1996 and 2016. My kids are part of it uh, and they've got a lot of skin in the game so they're going to solve this problem. And I think it's going to get solved, um, you know, by and large, with the help of government and with the help of uh, 
civil society, but I think it's going to get um, solved um, by um, uh, the private sector and by capitalism. Um, because at the end of the day, I think that, you know, values and value, to go back to what I said at the beginning, values and value uh, converge in the long run. And as investors become more long run, um, and as uh, Canadian pension plans in particular can be a leader there because we are long term, much more long term than, than, than many investors around the world. Um, I think the opportunity uh, to help finance uh, this tr uh, transition to a sustainable economy globally um, is going to be one where there's going to be huge um, economic rewards. Um, and I think that's what gives me uh, that's what gives me uh, optimism. So uh, with that, um, I will say um, happy holidays uh, to everybody. I hope you have a safe um, and socially distanced uh, holiday. And uh, I will turn it back to uh, to Anita. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, Jerry, Veronica and Allison. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your insights. It does sound like at least there are some consistent standards coming soon. So this isn't the wild west of reporting. And I think what I heard from all of you is that there is tremendous opportunity for Canada and for Canadians to take a lead in this area if we want to. And Mark, thank you for your expert moderation of today's discussion. Viewers, we hope that you can join us for our final event of the year before we break for the holidays. On Tuesday, December 15th, we'll host a panel of best-selling authors for discussion on hockey's cultural contribution to Canada. And our panelists include former Maple Leafs captain Rick Vibe and co-host of Hockey Night in Canada, Punjabi, Harnarayan Singh. Thank you again to Navigator for sponsoring today's event. Our events would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. And thank you to our AV supplier, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeetings.ca for making it possible for us to come together virtually today. Guests, thank you for joining us. Stay healthy and stay safe.